I criticize because this harms people. The amount of individuals we see at the clinic who are visibly distraught about this polymorphism is disheartening. My criticism is at the situation. It's never at the providers. I know the providers are doing the best they can, but guys, we have got to do better. Can testing your genetics improve your health? The answer, no. The data are clear, but I understand much of what you read or what you hear is counter to this. So let's go through the best available evidence that we have to date that clearly demonstrates genetic testing is not helpful and will not allow you to personalize diet or supplements. I wanna also be careful to say there are certain rare genetic disorders that do require medical treatment, this is not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to, I'm tired, I have brain fog, I'm overweight, I have issues with my bowels. Can gene testing help me? And the answer is no. But let's give you all the data so you can make your own informed decision. Hi, this is Dr. Michael Russo, DC. I am a practicing clinician, a clinical researcher, and a adjunct professor at the University of Bridgeport. Let's kick off our discussion with a phenomenal study, hot off the press, the Predentomic study, randomized control trial, 82 overweight adults. They were given the comprehensive workup. Well, geez, if we could just test, we would know why you can't lose weight, why you're tired. So we're going to, as this study did, test your urine, your blood, your saliva, and your genetics. And guess what? Each one of these, if they were done outside of a research setting where it's funded, you're probably looking at about $300 per test. So in total, this could be anywhere from one to maybe $2,000 of testing. That's the promise that testing will tell us how to make you feel better. But as you'll see, every one of these studies fails to demonstrate that. So the intervention, a control diet, a generic recommendation. Oh, generic, I don't like generic. Well, if generic means there are a number of clinical trials showing that that generic recommendation is helpful, then generic is good. Generic could mean tried and true. So generic control recommendations as compared to the personalized diet based upon all the markers, the urine, the blood, the saliva, and the genetics. A 10-week intervention was performed. Guess what? Both groups experienced essentially the same degree of weight loss, except one group spent one to $2,000 <laughs> to have the same results as the other group. Now, okay, maybe I'm cherry picking. Well, let's just put all the data up here on the screen. Difference in body fat, less than 1%. Difference in body weight, less than one pound. Difference in LDL cholesterol, less than one point. Again, between groups. Difference in waist circumference, less than a centimeter. Difference in glucose, about one point, And no difference in inflammatory markers. Leading these researchers to conclude, personalized dietary plans did not result in greater benefits over generic but generally healthy diet in a 10-week clinical trial. And guys, this is what matters. You can speculate, oh, this gene interferes with metabolism of that, and that SNP alters the metabolism of this. But at the end of the day, we have to test the hypothesis to make sure it's effective. In this case, goose egg. But Let's continue. Second paper, great paper by Dr. Tommy Wood, who has been on the podcast. They reviewed the obesity gene, a type 2 diabetes gene, and the infamous MTHFR gene. Results, individual risk, SNPs, polymorphisms, had less than 10% likelihood of affecting disease expression. They quote, the likelihood of any given genotyping result, meaning your gene test, in a meaningful difference in phenotype, meaning how you express, is relatively small. Continuing, the data suggest that most disease risk is dominated by the effect of the modern environment, providing further evidence to support the pursuit of lifestyle-based interventions that are likely to be beneficial 
regardless of the genetics. The tried and true interventions, the interventions that we know help people, personalize those to the person. I want to be vegetarian. Okay, let's give you a healthy vegetarian diet. I have a lot of gas and bloating. Okay, let's personalize a low FODMAP diet based upon you, not based upon your genes. But let's continue to build this case. Because, oh, by the way, I have no vested interest. I used to run tests just like the one we're about to discuss, the MTHFR gene test, and tell people that you should avoid folic acid because I thought that was the truth. And like any clinician, I want to help those with whom I work. However, with time, I've learned to fact check. And as I continue to fact check, especially in the realm of gene testing, my jaw has hit the floor because this is a series of the interventional studies looking at the effectiveness of gene testing guided interventions, and they all come up extremely disappointing. Enter MTHFR. This study looked at three genotypes. So with MTHFR, it does impact your metabolism of folic acid, but it does it so much so that it doesn't matter less than 10%. But let's test the hypothesis, right? So you have your CC or CT. This means you have no polymorphisms or one polymorphism, lower risk, or you have your TT, your homozygous, meaning you have both of the polymorphisms, high risk. Now, in this randomized control trial of 20,000 individuals, they were given either a blood pressure lowering medication as the control or that plus folic acid, not folate, folic acid. How did they get IRBR approval? <laughs> they gave people with MTHFR folic acid. Isn't that supposed to be so dangerous? Well, no, because they found that in this high risk allele, the homozygous polymorphism, they had a 30% reduction in stroke when they were given folic acid, when they were given the stuff that's supposed to be toxic to those with MTHFR, they had a 30% reduction in stroke. They had a better improvement than those who didn't have the gene or only had one copy of the gene. So how can we possibly continue to have stuff like this on the internet? And by the way, I think people should be free to say whatever they want. I am not a fan of regulating healthcare speech. I think that's a mistake. But we should point out this. I just did a quick search. And what you can see here is folic acid is the synthetic form of folate that cannot be used in those with MTHFR defect and which can be very toxic. Avoid, it goes on to say, avoid any supplements with folic acid. Well, geez, are we considering a 30% reduction in stroke toxic? Right? This other uh, website, those with some form of MTHFR gene mutation are not advised to take folic acid due to the risk of folic acid buildup. Again, I criticize because this harms people. The amount of individuals we see at the clinic who are visibly distraught about this polymorphism is disheartening. So my criticism is that the situation it's never at the providers. I know the providers are doing the best they can, but guys, we have got to do better. And not that I'm a big fan per se of the CDC, but I will call balls and strikes. If you're one person and you have a good opinion based upon the data, I will support you. And if you're the CDC and you have a good opinion based upon the data, I will support you. Even though I think one person or the CDC can screw things up, we have to call balls and strikes. And this is why the CDC uh, has this on their website, which is your body can safely and effectively process all different types of folate, including folic acid, if you have the polymorphism of MTHFR. Moving on, the Diet Fits trial by Christopher Gardner, who's also been on the podcast, and I really appreciate his work, especially because in this study, they made sure that the gene-guided diets were healthy versions. Sometimes there can be a higher carb diet that's kind of a crapitarian diet, if you will. It's a lot of processed and unhealthy carbohydrates. So Gardner did a good job of making sure that 
both the low fat and the low carb groups were healthy diets. So this wasn't a straw man. It was a randomized control trial in 600 overweight adults. And they used genotyping to personalize the dietary interventions along with insulin sensitivity testing. So a highly personalized, including genetic assessment, then puts you into a group with a diet based upon those assessments. After one year, both groups experienced essentially the same amount of weight loss. So again, the genes aren't helping. Leading Gardner and colleagues to conclude, there was no significant difference in weight change between healthy, low-fat diet versus a healthy, low-carb diet. Neither genotype pattern nor baseline insulin secretions were associated with dietary effects on weight loss. The Food for Me trial, also a randomized control trial. So again, this is where we are going to test the hypothesis. The gene does this. So if the gene affects this function, then if we intervene in such a way that favorably impacts that gene function, we will have a beneficial impact on the host. There's a difference between the promise of what could happen and what does actually happen. This is called the specious argument. It's not true, but it sounds appealing versus actual fact. So again, we're going to test based upon APOE polymorphisms to get the control, a standard set of dietary and lifestyle recommendations. And again, standard or generic doesn't mean bad if it's well studied and documented to be helpful as compared to a personalized dietary and lifestyle plan based upon their APOE4 genetics. And hopefully not surprising at this point, gene testing to personalize the recommendations did not lead to improvements in total cholesterol or in BMI. They didn't go so far as to do a full lipid panel, but they were able to demonstrate that total cholesterol, which is an important marker, and BMI did not change when undergoing this gene-guided dietary and lifestyle recommendation. Which leads me to what we try to espouse at the clinic, which is treat the person, not the labs. And this is reminiscent of what Sir William Osler said, the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. It's a similar concept where unfortunately now there are so many labs that are trying to help, but haven't yet been able to demonstrate that, albeit it sounds really appealing to the consumer and to the doctor, and we need to shift our paradigm to treating the individual because this is really what leads to the highest degree of success. Also bear in mind that these tests are expensive and they will lead people to be concerned, to be fearful, to perhaps avoid foods that they don't need to. The APOE4 is a good example. This may lead someone to be very reticent about eating meat, about eating fat, and they may not need to. As long as they're eating a healthy diet, they have some liberty in terms of how they eat. This matters because if you're someone who does better on a, let's say, omnivorous diet plan, but the APOE4 positivity is leading you to shoehorn yourself into a plant-based plan, then that is going to be harmful because you are now on a diet that doesn't feel good to you, plus you have fear, plus you're not getting any better. So where is the benefit? It costs more money. It leads to more fear. It leads to less personalized care and more rigid following of the gene-based recommendation. So all of this, not because I have any quarrel with the labs, but because I care about you. I care about making sure that you have sound health advice. And again, at the clinic, we so often see that people are really kind of railroaded into recommendations that are targeted toward the labs and not toward the person. So do your own research, let the data speak for themselves, and hopefully you find these data compelling. You avoid the gene testing and you look for interventions that are well studied, that are known to be helpful, and then you personalize them to you. Try a diet, try a supplement. If it feels good, keep going. If it doesn't, move on to the next experiment. Really simple, practical, effective, and less expensive. Alrighty. Well, hopefully this helps and I will talk to you guys next time.